But we just got it started and we've got a pretty good attendance. So. Get it up to one day. <laughs> um, okay, so first series, I guess, with this whole uh, first lecture of this whole series is about making an incision on the patient. Um, and then the following several series will be uh, looking at different types of general operations. Uh, which commonly you will see like appendicectomy, uh, cholecystectomy, even some bowel surgeries, or uh, what we do, liver surgery or pancreas surgery. Uh, basically, you will get a summary of what the anatomy that we normally ask you in theatre, basically, just to uh, familiarise yourself with it. It's not going to be enough for you to anatomist or the other active appendix but it's a trigger point for you to go home and maybe read a bit more on that area um, and uh, maximize your knowledge of the regional anatomy rather than the whole body because you won't be able to remember everything um, so the, the first uh, sort of couple of lectures is about basic and that uh, and the anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall. And we're going to cover laparoscopy. And there are two types of laparoscopy um, entries, if you like, and also uh, different types of incisions. And I just want to focus on the big lines of costume, which is what we do sometimes. And then it's still just particularly out there for interest. So let's start with laparoscopy. And so who's actually seen someone done a laparoscopy entry, have you noticed any sort of particular features or any, can you give me a rundown on it? Michael, <laughs> yes. Above or below? Usually above. Okay. It's usually below. Yeah. <laughs> Could be above, but I'll explain to you why it's harder to, to go above. Below, or you can explain to us later on why it's a kind of And any other features you remember looking at it? No? Just a lot of cutting, a lot of ceases. Yeah. Which is usually the case because the umbilicus is a very compact area where everything's just squashed into one focal point to stop or what we the cicatrix and we chose that point particularly because that is the closest or shortest distance to get into the peritoneal cavity and obviously will be the safest by virtue of that. But if you're not doing it correctly, you could easily get yourself off the course and keep the section and keep the section on you and just sort of strip the entire posterior wall of the abdomen. Um, often, like I said, you're still not doing it. <coughs> so we do need to learn the anatomy at that point and make sure even if you feel like it's suspicious that you're in but you're not quite right, then you, you work out which layer you're in at that point. And that comes with the knowledge of the layers of the uh, anterior top. So this is a typical picture of what you would see in that or any other anatomy textbook and it really just to give you a, uh, a rough guide on what quadrant you're on of the anterior abdominal wall and what position to 
going to make, um, which will go through which muscles later. As you can see, the top half of the abdomen, or say above the upper line, you're going to have almost identical right and left. Um, but you can see that on the lower part of the abdomen, that's actually quite different to the upper half. So if you're making a cut here as an optical entry, just sort of drilled into the abdomen, the layers that you're going to go through is different to the layers down here you're going to go through. And if you pay attention to the semi-lunaris line, which is here, that's also going to divide the, or subdivide the abdominal wall into the rectal, uh, rectus layer and the oblique layers. So if you're making a cut here, you're going to go through all three oblique muscles, external, internal, and transverse. Whereas if you're making a cut slightly more medial, just through the rectus, you're not going to go through any uh, external oblique muscles. Like you go through after. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so you need to know exactly where you cut it, why you cut it, and what muscle layers you need to know. So, we're going to have a quiz later on to see, you know, what layers if you're going to make a cut, say, I'm going to make a cut here, what muscle layers you need to know. Okay. I'm not going to bore you with all the terms and things because you know this, this lies you can have it all at home or you could just read up on the textbook and say yeah we've gone through this muscle we've gone through this artery this is where we're going to go. while i'm here my role here is to lead you to think about applying those knowledge as daily practice into your you know surgical rotation or you know, having surgical opportunities Operating theaters opportunities. Now, if you cut your abdominal wall axially and looking at the slide above and below the belly button, there's a particular structure that you should pay attention to, which is called the arcuate line. Do you know why it's what how the arcuate line is formed? Anyone? So above the arcuate line, you can see that there's anterior uh, rectus sheath, right? And it's formed by fusion of external oblique and a little bit of internal oblique, sort of split into half and gives one layer to the front and the other half of the internal leg goes to the back. That fills with transverse muscles, uh, fascia, which is this layer. Okay. And so you have a complete back and front wrapping of the rectus muscle, which is particularly strong at the upper half of the abdomen, because where, that's where all your pressure is. But human nature decided that below the arcuate line, or where that change of point is, usually about two centimeters below the upper line is, that's where you're starting to have everything just goes to the front. Okay, so both external or internal and transverse all swing to the front of the erectus. And there's no posterior sheath anymore. So if you're closing an abdomen, and you're telling me that you're closing the posterior sheet sort of below that arcuate line, I'll say you don't actually understand the anatomy there because there's no posterior sheet. It's just the transfer salus fascia, which is really weak, piece of little fascia. So you're not going to have any strength over there when you close it. And that's important because when we're doing other operations later on, when we talk about it, Laparoscopic internal hernia repair. This is important 
and you need to know that you're not going through the transfer sales fascia into the intra-abdominal space. You need to stay above that to create that pneumo space to do the hernia with you. All right. Now within that, the inferior epigastric vessels, which is probably the artery of the day today, it's running just behind the rectus usually, but the distance between the midline and the inferior epigastric can vary between patients and non catheters and also a wide area. But it's always at the back of the erectus. And so when you report scene or when you are um, uh, you know, making entry, optical entry, you just have to be very sure that you're not going through the artery when you're going through the rectus because you will hit it. And when you hit it, it's a difficult artery to fix because you've got no access at the time when you're putting the first pop in. So you need to either let it bleed for a while and until you put a second pop in and it's turned into a bigger cut, which is destroy the purpose of doing laparoscopic procedures. Any questions on this particular section? So then let's talk about the actual cut down technique, which is what general surgeons do. I mean, if you're talking to a gynecologist, they will ask you to do a varus needle technique, which is the traditional way or the first invented way of getting a, a nearby peritoneum. I guess the principle is the same because you're still going through the secretory here. This is the This is the bit. Yes, yes. And your needle is going to go through this way. But when we're making a cut down, we usually make a cut here, this point. Do you know what's sit between the linear elbow or sit between this layer here? What sits here? It's not. It's missing in the diagram. Yeah. Do you know how how thick the calcium ligament can be? Could be a lot of fat within the calcium ligament. So if you're making a cut above the belly button, the reason why I call it. Um, um, both because that's where the um, transfer cells fascia be a bit more uh, prominent in this layer. So in, in this segment, so you're not going to be uh, able to go through here confidently that you are not in the transfer in, in the falcinom ligament fat pad. So if you're doing a, a supra umbilical entry you run the risk of pushing a port through the fat, dig your ring, and you blow it up, the whole gas is just pushing all the calcium ligaments wide apart. And you put a camera in and you just think that you think it's momentum, but it's not. And you start digging around, you're gonna you know, reduce those gas, it's really difficult to um, withdraw or aspirate if you're in the wrong way. So you need to come out and start with the position again. And if you're doing a lap collie, you're going to have the falciform blocking the whole view of the gallbladder, um, which means that you know, you're going to get a suboptimal view and you need to excise the falciform and start all over again. So I always get a um, uh, infra umbilical if there is no contraindication, such as. Sometimes the patient could be pregnant and the uterus is coming up all the way up to almost hitting the umbilicus. I will stop and think about maybe I'll compromise it maybe doing a super umbilical incision, try not to injure the uterus or the baby. 
before if you already had a hernia repair down in the skin to umbilical region and you've got mesh over there, then you don't want to go through the mesh through the um, same incision again, then you can compromise through the umbilicus, a uh, supraumbilical incision. Or if the patient is very long, meaning the costal margin is right up there and you've barely got to this down here, you're not going to get enough distance from the camera or the angle of your instruments will be too high if you go infra umbilical. So you may actually need to come up to supraumbilical, go through the fast pad. In to make sure you're into the intra-abdominal space before you uh, in, um, start the gas flow. So there, the, it's not an absolute thing to do an infra-umbilical incision, but supra-umbilical incision you do need to um, be very careful about making sure you're in. So um, I haven't got a really good picture on how do we do the actual Hassan cut down technique of the cicatrice. So let's go back there a little bit. You know how this umbilical ring, when the knee elbow sort of comes onto the cicatrix, and have you ever seen the fibers sort of start going around it? And First, to get a bump in any other region. So that's the fibers that we're looking at for during the cut down phase. Um, and that's where the uh, Nini arborist does things to get into the peritoneal cavity. And so your, your, all your anterior sheep and posterior sheep come into the from the Nini alba comes up to the cicatrix. The fiber is starting to decussate around it, and that's where you would make a cut of the cicatrix and on the Nini alba to get through this point. Okay. Once you've got through this point, everything will just be um, retracted by your port. There's usually a little bit of the tip of your um, Hassan cannula port, and the balloon will push everything back up to the skin so that you're not getting separate layers of tissue uh, in this layer. Yeah. So if you've got a very young patient and a very thickened posterior sheet, when we're making the cut there, we usually use the artery forceps to go through the whole the incision and try to spread it wider. Sometimes you're actually splitting or, or spreading the posterior sheath further backward instead of coming up uh, or instead of making a hole to you. And you think, okay, you think you're in, there's nothing stopping you from um, going further, yeah, to the point you blow. That's still posterior shift, it's because you're actually just pushing this posterior shift um, downward instead of pushing through it. Make sense? Because you've got so many layers attached to one single point, and then you haven't cut every layer and you're pushing it uh, downward and outward. Some of those layers posteriorly can just be pushed away from you, instead of going through every layer and much wider. It, it makes sense when you actually see how we do it next time when we in here and we demonstrate, you know, the, the, uh, the layers of, um, of tissue that you're going through. And sometimes you do have to grab the layers that drop down, use artery force to grab it up and they would deliberately cut through it um, in that sense. And that's where uh, the danger of you know, using the needles winding and you just hope that you know, you're going through each all the layers that you hope. 
illegal because there's no vision to confirm that. All right. So you probably should auto this by now. Well, this is this is a tissue block that we're supposed to take away from this area. Just lateral to the rectus because you now have all the layers of the oblique muscles, right? So this is important if you're going to use an optical entry and the optical entry will show you have we have you all seen an optical entry of what is it about? Or? All right. It's a bit hard to talk about it now. Let me just has this got internet access? Yes, yeah. sure. Right. Should, <coughs> should we watch YouTube? <laughs> All right. So you put your scope through the port, which is still got the, um, the taper and the tip of it, with a little hole to allow your gas to go through the scope into the port and through out of the hole into the keratin cavity. As soon as you think you're ready, you can start blowing the gas. The main thing for that is you need to make sure the focus of your camera is correct. So you're not looking at blue picture. And you need to go through the skin, dermis, which is here. And the twisting action with a little bit of a blade, sometimes they have the old trigger of the blade. You go through the subcutaneous back. Okay. It's a very controlled movement not just you know pushing through the whole thing and hopefully you land into some you know, promised land <laughs> <laughs> um, and as you go through you also need to make sure there's no vessel that you're kind of drooling through or cutting through so that's the anterior fascia that you just cut through let's go back again just sort of see that white Layer there. I'm not quite sure if that's the interior fashion. I would argue that's just the scarf of it. All right. So that's posterior fashion now. Sometimes you've got bow sitting just underneath the peritoneum. So peritoneum is just one cell layer thick. So it's very at risk of if you have those trigger blade type entry forward. Yeah, so it's in there. So see, you could just see which layer as you go through. And so you need to know exactly which layer you think go through first by knowing which region you put the ports in. So I suspect he was okay. So I suspect he was going through either somewhere along here. Because he just gone through anterior, the muscle got pushed away, the rectus muscle, and then the posterior layer, and then the peritoneum. He 
he hasn't really seen any oblique muscle. He's got the posterior shift, so it's not down here. It's got to be somewhere here, which is sometimes normal position for for, um, for that poly or for other under rotation or upper GI surgery. You need to put closer to the action. So say if you have the optical entry here, lateral and out, you get through this layer and you'll, once you make a cut on the skin, you'll be going through that, the scar profession. You may not be seeing the camper fashion, which is fine. As long as you can see the scar, that's fine. Then your next, because you know your next level, level will be the anterior or external oblique phase, followed by internal. Sometimes you can see muscle fibers, sometimes you can just see the fascia itself, just the sheet, just a white sheet of uh, tissue. And transverses, again, could be you know, muscle fibers or uh, sheets only. Now, once you go through the transverse, uh, Transversus muscle, you need to be careful that you're not making a mistake. You are in the, uh, you're cutting through the perineum by cutting through transversalis fashion because you've got one more layer to go. And the way you tell that is usually there may be a bit of pre peritoneal fat between the transversalis and the peritoneum, which is this extra peritoneal fat. And that can be a lot of. Uh, a thick layer to go through. So meaning you need to uh, differentiate this type of fat and the intra-abdominal fat. And the color is different. The color of intra-abdominal fat tends to be paler, um, a bit more lobulated. The extra peritoneal fat is just more, um, what do you call it, just finer and orangey and you, you, you know, it's different kind of fat. And once you've gone through the peritoneum, if you look up, if you put your camera and look up to the, um, the anterior abdominal wall on the inside, you would see that there is a, uh, there's a space that you could go through and you push in further, then you know that you're in a, a free empty space where you you see bow, that's obviously you read, but you can't. Then you see that you're able to travel through an empty space, but you just haven't put in the memory frame in yet. And that's the point when you can take your camera out, and, you know, take the trocar out, and plate gas, and see where you are. And usually with optical entry, you go really slow flow, see. Where you are first, put the camera in, have a look, and if you confirm that you are in, then you switch to pipe one. Okay. Any questions so far? No? So, what if you stuff up? What if you, what if you got into the wrong way and you turn off the gas too much? What can you do? Yeah. <laughs> and you have to do optical entry because there's you no know, there's a big left bit line that probably before you worry about additions underneath. Any tricks? Leave the port in and make a separate incision and go somewhere else. And that port is going to be your other pointing port to location. And roughly that's where you're going to put your next port. And you can start again from there. Obviously, try not to make the same mistakes again. Um, what about bleeding? What if you hit the vessel? 
we're going to pull that one out. Yeah, again, no, don't pull it out. Just leave the port in, go somewhere else, <coughs> put a fresh port in, put a camera, in, you know, get access, put a camera in, see what happens. You've got an artery that you're going to, you need to uh, control, then you can either use an anto close device, which is a little sort of straight device hooking onto the string of suture, push screw the whole thing together, wraps around, let go of the string, go from the other side, grab the string, pull it up so it can tie the artery on that side. So it is dangerous that if you do it under control fashion, then you know that you know this is more um, you know, this is the anatomy that you're going through, then you're not going to break down and say, oh where am I? I hit bow. Turn into an abnormal. Yeah. All right. So we talked about bleeding, and this is a little diagram that we found quite useful sometimes to uh, remind ourselves where do you expect the inferior gastric vessels are, both sides. Um, it has a various sort of distance between it and the midline it closes it's not at the amyloidus surprisingly it's actually just slightly below the amyloidus so if that's where you're going to uh, place your port then you need to be exactly you know, where, uh, where, it, where it is and sometimes you can see it from underneath the abdomen when you put the first port in Say if you make an infant like on the side, cut down, you've done, you know, you've got access, you've gained entry, new mode's already up, put a camera in, you flick the camera, you can see vessels coming up underneath the rectus. And you can avoid them. You don't always have to guess where it is, you can always sometimes see it. Okay. And if you don't have access, and if you want to have a rule of thumb, how to avoid inferior gastric, say doing an appendix, then my rule is that if you draw a line between ASIS and umbilicus, okay, imaginary line, if you put your ports above this line, somewhere here, the chance of you hitting the epigastric vessel is minimal. Not sure I haven't done that yet, but that's my rule because that's where you're going to put it. If you draw a line here and you put it below this line, could hit this vessel because this vessel doesn't always come up medial. If you've got a wide patient, the artery is here, and you could just you know have it taking off quite early and quite high as well, and you can come up like that. But it never goes above the line between the umbilicus and the ASIS. So that would be my line of safety. If, you, if I pass that line beyond <coughs> below that line of safety, I'll have to be careful. Not that I can't put what there if I need to, but, but I just be very careful because I know, and that's where the knowledge of the anatomy here. So where does it come off? A bit of an anatomy now, I suppose. Which vessel? External. External. Is that what you External idea. And how is it in relation to deep rib? Medial or 
the divine aspects of it. Yeah. 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 Media, it's one of the corner of as a vector number. Yeah. So it runs medial to the degree. It brings here, this is my right. That's in here at the gastric test. It brings here. And it just you know, sitting next to it. And you can see it quite well as we talk about a lap even earlier in the airline. And it comes up, forms the Hasselbeck triangle, which is here. So, what's Hasselbeck triangle? Have you guys actually had an anatomy lecture? We had him before clinical and like fleeting and then did one in the last four hundred and fifty other lectures. Oh right. Yeah. So I should really treat this as like the first ever <laughs> an anatomy session. Right. right. Like things are ringing bells, I should because Simon told me that I should make it as clickable to surgical. Sort of procedures as much as we could. I don't know how to. No, it's good to make it surgical because the ones that we've always always had, you can't use them up anyway. So it's hard yeah. to then make the switch. So we can look this stuff up ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, it's got to be a waste of time for me just to regurgitate all the names. Yeah. 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 The definition of will you on the spot kind of thing. And then, you know, go and revise it. And now you know why we need to know about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe hopefully get a bit more um, implantation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, so be careful with inferior gastric when you're putting ports away from midline. Okay, if you're gonna just put a midline assigned into a like cup, that's not not gonna get inferior gastric. But anywhere. Lateral to rectus muscles, that's fine too, but just make sure you above the line of ASIS and um, uh, umbilicus. That, this is actually a wrong diagram. Um, ASIS should be here, and the inguinal ligament is from ASIS to. I heard synthesis and cubicle. 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 All right. Okay. So, yeah, so see that it's just a little bit um, slightly below the upper like it's, it's the shortest distance to the bit line, but you know, everyone's different. And where does it, what, what does it end us the most of it? Yep. So it's sort of a branch between, uh, from the internal thorax then turn into muscular weight and superior capacity. Okay, good. All right, so that's laparoscopic incisions and its anatomy in sort of nutshell because that's pretty much what we need to know in terms of safety where you're going to make a cut and you know what sort of things you need to avoid um, when doing that all right we'll move on to open incisions then all right traditional laparotomy bit line um, Again, you need to. The, the trick for laparotomy, midline laparotomy, is that you sh just make sure you do it on the midline. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of us, well, including myself, have been helping in the early days, uh, when you're making a cut, you're not actually making it at the midline. You, your skin incision probably is at the midline, but when you are retracting or when you have a sort of slightly impaired system um, <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna pull so hard because you're nervous you're operating right? and then your assistant just let you pull further and further closer to yourself 
And so you deviate it from the decline as you do it without the, um, the sanction. So you, when you land on the interior sheet, you think, oh, yeah, midline, let's go over. You see muscles. Crap. Okay, where's the midline? Then you make another cut next to it. Still muscle, make another cut. So you ended up serrating the entire interior sheet. <laughs> <laughs> and you just try to make holes on the interior sheet. Becomes okay. Finally, got a bit line. Oh, geez, the actual defect is this wine instead of one thin cut. So, be very careful where you're going to be. Um, where's your bit line going to? And once you've gone through the bit line at the mini alba, the rest of that is just you know, based on you know putting your finger through, tender it up, just use the dark bend, you know, go through the bit line, up and down. So, how do you identify the midline without seeing it? It's the trick um, of a midline astronomy, I suppose. Um, there's several ways. It depends on where you're going to enter the reactor and how long the position is going to be, and um, um, whether you've got you know, a, a, a field of the midline, the meaning of see that the muscle sort of start indentated into the mini elbow or come sort of together and you can use your hand to roll it around it, feel where the little thing is a little bit. And if you're not sure you could just come back, have a look at the actual patient <coughs> size, skin and orientation you know, in a relaxed position where the belly button and the sit is going so trying to make an imaginary line between them okay and you know that's usually the right line that you should go on to so you know pulling it but you can track it sideways and just try to go through the middle so let everything go just observe the line again between sit and the belly button and try to go through there and usually you you know, see muscles start to be, uh, disappear. It's just got nearly an hour before. And, um, and so the linear arbor is like the, why do we like to go through the linear arbor? Yeah, yeah, because that's, that's pretty much in sensory. Not quite. There's no major nerve endings there, no vessels there, and um, you don't have to go through muscles to cause bleeding. And um, uh, it's got a you know really tough strength. When, even if you go through it, when you sew it back up again, you're still maintaining a decent amount of. Strength for the abdominal wall to hold on to the tanks, so not from the incisional area. If you're making a cut somewhere else, which we'll talk about later, the chance of that developing hernia is much higher than making a big line. And that's important to recognize because that's obviously something you need to warn your patient if you're going to make a cut somewhere else. So, as you can see in this diagram here, everything just nicely single line when you close it all back together. And that's where you should be because you know, primary healing or healing by primary intention is about opposition. And we've gone away from closing every single layer to just close the Leading over and then the skin because we don't recognize that any there's any strength in the scar fascia. There may be plastic surgeons will say, Oh, yeah, that's, that's definitely strength. In there. But we haven't had much differences in terms of our species and paper breaks so far, so we're not quite, we're not as concerned as that. Um, but you should close it 
so that everything uh, comes back to the same level, you're not sort of having a, a stepped appearance. So that depends on how you place your needle. So your the arc of the needle has to be equal on both sides. You're not entering high and coming out shallow on the other side, so that you have this sort of imbalance height of closure. And that's a technical error if you uh, add it up like that. So you need to sort of be careful. And there's a plane between each layers of this uh, abdominal wall. Each plane has a kind of an empty space for you to work on. So sometimes you do need to dissect the fat of uh, superficial to anterior sheet, maybe two centimeters off the bit line, and you're specifically looking for the anterior sheet when you're dissecting uh, the fat of it, so you're not making holes on the anterior sheet. Is it too much? Too confusing? Yeah. Maybe. So let me show you. So here you've got the anterior sheet here. Yeah? So that's a lot of fat. Um, sometimes the edge of the median elbow is hidden underneath the fat, so you can't see where the needle goes through. You may be able to feel it, but you don't, you don't know the distance and the width and all that. So by dissecting this fat away from the midline, meaning off this anterior shift, you know exactly where you place your needle through the anterior shift and come out on the bottom, and go back in and come out again. It takes a bit of time to finish off your operation, but it may be worthwhile if you've got a, a large patient or someone that you worry about tissue quality, you know, diabetes, or infection. You don't want to go back to fix up a little bit. This is especially old lady. 90 years old, you could probably just project her for, project her for one operation and that's it. You're taking her back for a second time because of the complications from that. So you want to do it all right from the beginning. So, how did the fracture Yeah, I don't think you could just use a gauze to wipe it off the anterior sheet, but you could. Um, you could see spidery cobweb kind of quality tissue, the fibers, and you can just place the diaphragm through those spidery fibers. And once you had a big quality, you could start peeling things away. Mind you, there's a little bit of vessels going directly through the muscles and through the anterior sheet onto those back. And they can be quite stinky. So, uh, when you are having trouble, uh, fat's not moving, that's because those perforators are holding onto it. So you, you know, either use a diaphragm or use, uh, use a debate here, grab hold of it, burn it properly before you actually just the same through. Yeah. And there's about several, maybe six or seven perforators the whole length. Depends on how, how long the incision is. Okay, so then the next incision that we sometimes have to get. Um, any considerations with navigating around the other one? Uh, so just go around yeah. the other one. Yeah. I, I personally go around it um, just because. I don't see the point of going through it's we are going at bit line already and you've got to get into the um, pretty easily the bit line approach i don't see the point of going through the six to get into the bit line but i mean you could go around it and make the line just sort of more intact but colorectal surgeons they like going through it so one. And 
if you do go through it, then it becomes a very deep wound that you don't know whether you're actually having action underneath it. Um, because when you're closing, you may not be able to see this service clearly. Because, you know, the envelope is just a bunch of skin just sort of tucked down to the bottom of it. Um, so you can't really look straight at it and pay attention onto it. So you just relied on, relied on the tissue to come together nicely. So they're constantly having discharge going through the base, the base of the envelopes, which is not, not very nice. Um, and if you're going around, it depends on what side of operation you're going to do. If you're going to do a right heading or to right side of procedure, then you go to the right side. So that you're actually gaining more space and then because it, it's just arbitrary, it's just like one centimeter extra space going around. And it doesn't matter which side you're going through. It's got circular blood supply to it. What's the blood supply to it? It's the superficial and the gastric. Yeah. So you get that um, there's a superficial system and an inferior <coughs> deep system, which is the inferior and the gastric vessels. So this, the superficial system comes from mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so this is another uh, incision that we sometimes have to make for patients who have difficult gallbladder incisions or traditionally we do whipples with subcostal incision uh, or liver resection that we just use the right side of the liver. Uh, we're just taking the right side of the liver. Mobilize the left leg. And can anyone tell me what's the problem of making a subcostal incision by looking at this line? My incision is going to be like. Yeah. What's the big deal? Wrong with cutting through there. You're going to cut through muscles for sure. You're going to cut through everything. But why cutting through the nerve? Yeah. Yeah. And then what happened afterwards? Yeah. So, costal incision by far has the highest incision in any of it's purely because of this particular phenomenon. We're cutting through all the innervating nerves to the muscle. Yes, it's not really where the strains are, it's the fascia, but it does contribute to the whole wound healing process and also long term ones where you have no muscles there, um, you're getting a bit of horizontal diverification that just becomes you know, a thin layer of sheen and skin and that's it. And so in that particular spot, you're not usually um, um, going to have a lot of structure to support it otherwise. Um, it's a very mobile part of the you know, abdominal wall because you're breathing all the time and you're twisting all the time. So you you lost, you know, the innovation to the obliques and the rectus muscle in that part of the abdomen. Um, you're going to have you know, incisions mainly developed, and it's a very common type of question that we get asked 
fellowship exam. People can come up to this short case station and hold it and participate. So we have to get on the radio and continue to explain why this is issue as as a very rather than some of the decisions that we make out later. Yeah, so not the blood vessels, not the actual muscle itself. You can cut the muscles and you can just oppose it together by like closing the sheet containing it, and it will somehow grow back together. But if you do not lost if you lost the nerves that innervate it, they will not um, grow together and not probably at least you know maybe if not hundred percent, maybe seventy percent of the strength. They will not get back those strength. So um, be careful with some cross doing issue. Now, yes, you, you have to do it sometimes, but uh, close it properly, make sure all the layers are closed. We do two layers closure here rather than just single mass closure in the Vikram and Ron, just because that you need to close every single uh, layer of the oblique muscles as well. So, where do all these nerves come from? The back, yes. Which flame? It also supplies the skin sensation of the back. And it's segmental, so you know you get dermatones, and, and that's how you also uh, get um, epidural working for you as well. So that if you've got an epidural, if you've got an upper midline position, the anisid is going to be epidural, you need to calculate that level of dermatome to anisotize. Right. So, yeah, work out the layers of, <coughs> or work out the dermatome, and that's where you have to apply skin dermatome onto, onto your incision or onto your surgical practice. Is that's where you would be looking at anesthetizing that part of the skin where the incision is made. Is that ventral? Confirmed? No. Yeah, it's ventral. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, we go to the last incision, which is a very nice and neat, um, tidy incision. Anyone recognize? This is Ben and Steel. Yes. Ben and Steel is a surgeon in Scotland. Anyway, um, he invented this incision for himself when he was doing cesareans, the um, section for him back then. But then he fingerprinted himself and got septicemia and died by doing this incision. <laughs> It's not as well, I guess. Back then, sterility is not really that important. Um, so, again, it's an application of his anatom anatomical knowledge to this part of the abdomen, which is really down low, uh, right here. All right. And that's typically what you would get for any sort of. Um, gynecological incisions or if you had a large specimen that you want to take out from upper abdomen and you want to take it out through a less painful incision, you would have to make a separate cut here to withdraw the specimen rather than making a midline cut on the take it out. So destroy the purpose of doing laparoscopic procedure. Um, there are several reasons why this is Less painful and, and heals 
very nicely uh, for the body because number one, when we're making an incision, this is all dragged downward like that, but you should make a horizontal incision so you're not cutting across nerve endings, you're cutting within the borders of the dermatome, so it's nicer for the nerves to adapt to it. Um, and it's down low in this area here, which is uh, less sensation, um, less sensation than um, further up here. This, this, for some reason, the inner thigh and the um, sort of pen's pocket area is governed by a different group of nerves rather than the segmental nerves from the, um, the spine. So it's kind of like a watershed area of nerve um, sensation. Um, and you could make a small cut, but get really wide access once you've gone through the anterior shift big to the skin incision. So again, bang for your buck, so you know, small incision, wide access. This is what we are. And so during this incision, you're going to have the orientation of your cut changes several times. Horizontal cut on the skin, and as you go in, got down to the rectus layer, there, you're going to make a little cut or, or spread of the rectus vertically. You're not cutting through rectus muscle so that you can protect you know, the, the integrity of the rectus, the rectus muscle. And as you retract the rectus muscle, well, you need to make a horizontal cut on the anterior sheath first before you get down to the rectus muscle. And that's fine, you can make a horizontal cut. You don't have to make it wide. Um, and then once you retract the rectus muscle, you get transverse salus fascia below. And that's, can be go vertically because that's got no strength. You could just improve the access by doing this way vertically. And peritoneum will be just underneath it, and you could do it vertically as well. And usually, you would also separate the anterior sheet off the rectus muscle for about at least five centimeters upward. Separating meaning. You just gently push the muscle down. There's spidery fibers again, and also perforators and vessels. So you need to be careful not to, to tear those vessels. Uh, and once you've got enough space, then the muscle will go, you know, converting the length into width. So the more you free it up vertically, not cutting, just freeing up vertically. You've got more mobility for your muscles to go wider. And so you open up the actual incision for yourself. Okay. And you can just do that by doing so. And then you just make a vertical cut on the pregnant. You will get your retractors to do the side retraction for yourself. Okay. So nice and you know, neat incision for that part of the region. And then you need to close all, all the layers that you on before. Close the peritoneum transversalis vertically with absorbable suction. Then I'll just oppose the muscle together. I don't strangulate them. And then use you know, strong one PDS sutures to close the anterior shift horizontally. Whether or not you can close the fat, I don't care, but you, know, you can just make it. Laser field rifle sutures to put them together. And then the skin. Um, yeah, and you can also inject local anesthetics around that plane underneath the uh, rectus muscle as well, because that's where the nerves come to the bone. It's where's the neurovascular plane in the acronym between which muscles? Between the internal and transverses. Okay. And 
is the same on the chest between the inner bones and the inner intercostal muscles. Um, yeah, it's easy to remember. Remember one and you remember the other. Okay. And yeah, so that's the anterior abdominal wall. Um, questions? I guess it's just a, in, an introduction to what you can do to the patient in terms of making axes. It's going to make a cut first. And once you know how to make a cut, then you know, you know what you can do inside in the next step of action. Questions? You don't understand? Is that too much information or is it just about right or is it too shallow? No? What more? It's about it. Isn't it? I think with certain procedures. Yeah, it's good. So, yeah. I think I think you need to I mean gone through the days where we've known anatomy just by reading matter and, and last. We still do because you do need to have some words to talk about anatomy. You don't just say, oh yeah, that archery there, that there, there. I know that structure's there. In last, um, everything's so concise and you could just talk about the whole region within the several, you know, within several sentences. And that's the beauty of developing your your description of a certain Area or certain thing like you're going to get asked when you grow old um, if you don't do surgery. Um, tell us about the cause of the left urethra. Okay, you're going to describe the entire cause within five minutes without you know humming and ahhing, without talking about you know, unnecessary information, you know, really pinpointing on. This is what we need to know to pass. And it, most of the sentences that you're going to create is actually by reading those books. And by reading those books, you, you're actually drawing a three dimensional picture in your mind, trying to imagine, okay, I'm walking through this period now. This is um, what I'm going down. And when you're talking about the actual remember. So don't don't just sort of discourage people by reading books these days. I know it's difficult, but it's boring. But if you want to master the description side of things of anatomy, then those books are useful in that sense. Still pictures and actual being in operation and seeing those things help you remember it. Um, you probably have to read seven times to get there, by seeing once or twice, you know exactly what it is. Uh, but yeah, reading books helps you to describe it. Yeah, thanks for the tips. Um, would you join me in thanking him for <laughs> <laughs> um, we've also got Margaret from MIPS to speak to us for a few minutes. Um, MIPS has been sponsoring us for this year and um, we have provided food as well after, so um, you can join us for that after she's done. Thanks, Margaret. Well, we have there as well.